Hi, it's Kate, and this is the fifth and final video for week two of Math 23. Our topic of conversation is the cross product, which is another important feature of linear algebra and vectors. The cross product is similar to the dot product in that it acts on two vectors, but unlike the dot product, which results in a scalar, the cross product results in another vector. It should also be noted that the cross product only exists in R3. Let's make sense of this formula. We have two vectors, a and b, and here's the formula for the cross product. Now, how do we calculate it? Let's look at the first component here. The way to calculate it is to ignore the first row of the two vectors and then pretend that you're looking at a matrix made up of the second two rows. It looks like this. And we calculate its determinant, which is a2b3 minus a3b2. And that gives us the first component. Now, what's really important is that we did this in a cyclic fashion. That means we first ignored and then this was the first row of our pretend matrix and the second row of our pretend matrix. That's not so easy to forget for the first component, but it is for the second because let's take a look. So for the second component, this guy right here, we ignore this row and then because this is in cyclic fashion, this will be the first row of our pretend matrix and this will be the second. So we write that down. We calculate the determinant of that a3 times b1 minus a1 times b3. That's our second row. Note that some people think, oh, I can just ignore this and then calculate the determinant of that, but it has the opposite sign of what should be there. So you can either do that and remember to multiply by negative 1, or remember the cyclic trick, which is ignore and then the pretend matrix that you're thinking of the determinant for is first row, second row. And then so for our third component, we ignore these components and then cyclic fashion goes back to the beginning. This is the first row of the matrix, this is the second. And that determinant, a1 times b2 minus a2 times b1, gives us our third component. So that's how we calculate the cross product. What are some of its properties? Well, first, a cross B equals negative B cross A. What do we call this? Well, we call this anti-commuting. It returns the same answer in terms of magnitude, but opposite sign if we swap the order of two vectors when we take the cross product. The next thing you should know is that if you take a vector and cross it with itself, you'll get zero. This seems pretty clear when we look at the recipe. Imagine instead of b1, b2, b3, we just had another a1, a2, a3 vector. Then this would say a2 times a3 minus a3 times a2, and since these vectors are, have components that are members of fields and multiplication commutes, a2 times a3 is the same as a3 times a2, and so this would be 0. And then doing the same thing here, this component would end up being 0, this component would end up being 0, and that's how we end up with the 0 vector. Note that there's a typo here. I would like to turn that into a zero vector instead of uh, a zero scalar. There we go. All right, so for fixed a, a cross with b is a linear function of b and vice versa. So what does that mean? If the cross product is a linear function, well, there are two things. Take a moment, try to write them down. Think you got it? Okay. Here's the first one. If I took the vector a and crossed it with the sum of vectors b and c, that would be the same thing as if I took the vector a and crossed it with the vector b and then added on a crossed with the vector c. What's the second one? Here it is. There are like a million ways to write it, so I apologize. In this case, alpha here is a scalar. If I took the vector a and crossed it with a scalar multiple of b, that would be the same thing as if I took the same scalar multiple but of a and crossed it with b, or if I took a, crossed it with b, and then multiplied it by the same scalar. All of these are equivalent. All right, next. For the standard basis vectors, e sub i cross e sub j, they equal e sub k. If 
I, J, and K are in cyclic increasing order. Note that here are some examples, 1, 2, 3, 2, 3, 1, or 3, 1, 2. Otherwise, if they're out of order, E sub I crossed with E sub J will give you negative E sub K. Let's take a look at number 5. A cross B dotted with C is equal to A dotted with B cross C. And note that because of how the dot product works, that it acts on two vectors and returns a scalar, the way you would have to commute this by hand is to do the cross products first, so that you have the second vector to do the dot product with A. Otherwise, if you did the dot product first, all of a sudden you'd have this scalar and you could no longer compute the cross product. This is called the scalar triple product. It's also called the determinant of the matrix whose columns are A, B, and C. So there's one way to calculate a 3 by 3 matrix's determinant. Let's take a look at number 6. We have that A crossed with B and then crossed with C. Note that we do have a little bit of grouping going on here. Is equal to A dotted with C times B minus B dotted with C times A. This you can actually prove by brute force, sort of the way you write out things with components and then you just go through and calculate them. It's a bit long-winded, but definitely works out in the end. A crossed with B is orthogonal to the plane spanned by A and B. This is really important. I particularly enjoy this guy right here. Why is that? Well, we know that two vectors that are orthogonal to each other, when you take the dot product between them, you will get zero. So it's really important to remember that A crossed with B and then dotted with A, like that, is zero, as is this. So it's good to note that if you ever have a scalar triple product where one of the vectors is repeated, you'll get a zero because of this fact, that the cross product is orthogonal to the plane spanned by A and B, which means the plane that both A and B are in. All right, we'll talk more about what spanning means later in the course in the next couple weeks, but for now, that definition works quite nicely. All right, here we have that the quantity, the magnitude of the cross product, right, because this is a vector, we can take its magnitude, squared, is equal to the magnitude of A squared times the magnitude of B squared minus A dotted with B squared. Hmm, interesting. Also something that you can prove using brute force uh, opportunities there. The length of A crossed with B, this magnitude of the cross product, is the length of A times the length of B times sine alpha where alpha is the angle between A and B that is less than 180 degrees. All right, the length of A crossed with B is equal to the area of the parallelogram spanned by A and B. And you guys can actually use this formula to draw out a parallelogram and see how the area of the parallelogram spanned by A and B and what do I mean by that? Well, if I have two vectors A and B like this, well, they span a parallelogram because I can translate B to this side of A, and I can translate A to this side of B, and it will create a full parallelogram like this. So the length of the cross product is equal to the area of this parallelogram, and you guys know formulas for the area of a parallelogram. Uh, in geometry class, I suppose, is where you learn that. And you can see if you are looking at where alpha is, which happens to be this angle, why this recipe for the length of the cross product would be equal to the area of this parallelogram. Let's take another look at determinants. All right, we mentioned that the cross product and really the scalar triple product is a way to calculate the determinant of a 3 by 3 matrix. And again, the way to think of that is this. If you're looking at a 3 by 3 matrix named A, and we look at its columns sort of independently as A1, A2, and A3, like this, then if we treat the columns as independent vectors, the way to calculate the determinant of this matrix is by taking 
the column A1, crossing it with the column A2, and dotting it with the column A3. And that's going to give you the determinant for this entire matrix. Well, note that the determinant is going to change sign if you interchange, swap the order of any of these two columns. It's easiest to prove for columns 1 and 2 because if we, we know that the cross product anti-commutes but it's true for any two, actually. We could swap 3 and 1 here, and the same thing would happen. Another thing is that the determinant is a linear function of each column. Again, easiest to prove for column 3, but true for any column. Well, what Say I could express A2 as the sum of two vectors. Let's take a look at that. Here, I've expressed A2 as the sum of B1 and B2. Now we know that from the linearity of the cross product, I can rewrite this like this. Right? That was from our third property under the cross product. And then I also know that the dot product distributes over addition. And so I can rewrite it like this. Sorry, I started to run out of space. But this says A1 crossed with B1. Whoops, let me get a little vector arrow there in. Okay, A1 crossed with B1 dotted with A3 plus A1 crossed with B2 dotted with A3. And so we can see if we start with something like this and we end up with this, we have linearity of the determinant because this is the definition of the determinant. The only thing I've exploited here was the linearity of the cross product and distributing the dot product over addition. You guys can go through by hand and show that this would be true if I expressed the column A1 as a sum of two vectors and the column A3 as a sum of two vectors. A3 again is easiest. And multiplying any single column by a scalar will multiply the determinant by that scalar. And last but not least, the 3 by 3 identity matrix with ones down the diagonal and zeros elsewhere has a determinant of 1. And the last thing that you need to know is that the magnitude of A crossed with B and dotted with C. So that's already going to be a scalar, but we're just talking about the magnitude, not whether it's positive or negative, etc. is equal to the volume of the parallelopiped spanned by A, B, and C. Well, you may be wondering, what is a parallelopiped? Here are my three vectors. I've made them all have the same anchor point. And then the parallelopiped is similar to how we constructed this parallelogram that was spanned by A and B, but now we have three vectors, so a parallelopiped is a three-dimensional parallelogram. Let's take a look. Not bad. I got a little crazy and crossed out some things over here, but ignore that. So what I've done is I translated C to the endpoint of this vector as well as the endpoint over here and the endpoint over here, and so it's like a three-dimensional parallelogram sort of prism. So you guys can go through and think about exactly what this might look like component by component and how that would correspond to the volume here using both the definition of the cross and the definition of the dot product but there's a particularly useful application here. What does it mean if the magnitude of A crossed with B dotted with C is zero? What does it mean if the volume of the parallelopiped spanned by A, B, and C are zero? Well, it means that if something three-dimensional has zero three-dimensional volume, that means it's not three-dimensional. It's flat as a pancake. They are what we call coplanar. All the vectors are in the same plane. So if you're given three vectors and you calculate their scalar triple product, A crossed with B dotted with C, and it gives you zero, that means that the parallelopiped spanned by these three vectors is actually a parallelogram, flat as a pancake, like this. and nothing more. Or it could be even worse. Perhaps they're pointing all in the same direction and they actually all lie on a line. But the point is, is that they don't span a three-dimensional object. So that's something really important. When you have a question that asks you, are these vectors coplanar? Do they lie in the same plane? The way to check that is to try to compute their scalar triple product. If the scalar triple product gives you a volume of zero, yes, that means that they lie in the same plane. If the scalar triple product gives you a non-zero number, then no, they don't lie in the same plane. They actually do form a parallelopiped. Last but not least, 
An interesting property of the determinant of three by three matrices is that if a matrix C is the product of matrices A and B, then the determinant of C is equal to the determinant of A times the determinant of B. This is frequently referred to as the determinant of the product of two matrices is equal to the product of the determinants of those matrices. And that is going to be one of the proofs that we talk about in class and you will be responsible for in this course. That concludes the videos for week two.